So thanks everyone for coming and for your interest in our work on the Anacostia. Um, we released this report, I brought copies for folks who are interested in having copies, um, on May 2nd at an event at the Yards Park down on the waterfront uh, with remarks from federal and local officials. And now um, that we've written the report, the conversations um, should begin about implementation of some of the recommendations. And so we're so grateful to Chris for organizing this as one of those first discussions. It's important and we want to get folks ideas and feedback. So we've organized a presentation, but I hope that folks will interrupt with questions um, as we kind of proceed. And then I know you wanted to have a discussion. So the report came out of um, an effort that really Linda and some other key stakeholders brought to our attention. There is a lot of progress going on um, in the district and in the two counties on the Anacostia. We have a lot of regulatory progress. Uh, the Anacostia Partnership, which is um, a partnership of federal and local and state organizations, as well as some businesses and nonprofits, released a major new restoration plan last spring. And there's just been huge efforts by groups like the Anacostia Watershed Society um, and the Riverkeeper and NRDC and others, both on the policy side and on the cleanup side. But we know um, that the cleanup of the Anacostia River is a long-term endeavor due to the centuries of degradation that it has faced. And so we were asked to kind of take a look, take a step back and take a look at what was being accomplished from a regulatory and legal perspective on the Anacostia and where that was going to get us and then to identify some remaining gaps and to make some recommendations based on those remaining gaps for how some of them might be covered and how we could accelerate this process that's already been started. So, so that was our task at hand and as um, Linda said, we work, um, we're a small organization at DC Appleseed. For those who don't know DC Appleseed, we're an independent, nonpartisan, nonprofit organization. Some call us a think tank. Somebody else referred to us as a do tank recently. Um, and we do do research and analysis, put out big reports, but then we really follow up with advocacy efforts and partner with uh, both government entities and entities outside of government to see forward um, the implementation of the recommendations that we've made. So we work with pro bono firms to do that work because we are a staff of seven or eight now and we certainly can't do uh, our work on our own. And so for this particular project, you can see our pro bono project team listed here. It consisted of four law firms, uh, Cornerstone Research, which did economic consulting for us, as well as environmental resources management, which is an environmental engineering firm. And our pro bono project team was led by Russ Randall at Pet and Boggs and his team. Um, okay, so the content of the report. The report basically covers four major issues that we wanted to discuss today. Um, first, benefits from a revitalized Anacostia. Second, major pollution problems. Third, existing cleanup obligations and remaining impediments to restoration. And then four, the meat of the discussion, key policy recommendations that are made in the report. I'm going to cover the first three in a very quick fashion. I think most folks around the room are pretty familiar with the Anacostia and its issues, and I think folks would rather discuss some of the policy issues at hand. So I'll go quickly through the first three and then turn it over to Russ. So the benefits of a revitalized Anacostia. Um, we thought it was important to make the case for what benefits could be achieved if we were going to engage in a long-term restoration effort. And there's pretty clear primary benefits of a cleaner Anacostia River that have been identified by stakeholders, and those include improved recreation, better boating, having a natural wildlife refuge right in the middle of the city that folks can go to and enjoy and get away from the congestion, and ultimately swimmable and fishable river. And, and those are the primary benefits. But there are also economic and community benefits that we think are particularly derived from using green infrastructure throughout the watershed. And by green infrastructure, I mean um, 
rain cisterns, rain gardens, tree canopies, bioretention swales, all of those things that you all know of um, that would have to be applied to address our stormwater problem throughout the watershed. And we think there's some real benefits that come from those things. And those things include new jobs and new business opportunities, which are sorely needed in some areas of the Anacostia watershed, um, particularly east of the river, as well as um, improved quality of life, and enhanced economic development opportunities. We think that green infrastructure not only makes an area more attractive, but also can promote the area's environmentally sustainable and forward-thinking image, and therefore can signal a high quality of life, attract businesses, attract residents, that kind of thing. And then finally, there's avoided costs that come um, from less energy use and less use and maintenance of gray infrastructure. Um, okay, so the watershed, just for folks who aren't as familiar with it, you know, the Anacostia water is a little over eight miles, and the majority of the tidal river runs through the District of Columbia, um, some through Bladensburg and Maryland, but the actual watershed itself is 176 square miles, and most of it is located in Maryland. So here's a kind of blurry map, and the watershed is the blue area, Montgomery County, Prince George's, and D.C. Um, it's home to over 800,000 residents, which is a population bigger than the District of Columbia as a whole, and it's one of the most densely populated watersheds in the Chesapeake Bay drainage area. 70% of the watershed is developed and 25% of it is impervious. And so we're talking about a very densely developed, very <coughs> impervious watershed here. And Russ and I did some math on this based on data that COG shared with us. Um, and there's about 43 square miles of impervious surface in the Anacostia watershed, which is roughly the land size of the city of Boston. Um, so all of this dense development, why is it important? Most of you know it's important because it's a cause of the river's major stressor, which is urban and suburban stormwater runoff. Um, and so, you know, stormwater comes down instead of infiltrating and evapotranspirating into our natural systems. It comes down, hits these roofs, roofs, roofs parking lots, um, driveways, and runs into our sewer system and then dumps oftentimes directly into our streams and rivers, um, carrying pollutants along the way and causing erosion in streams. Um, the river also suffers from combined sewer overflows. As you know, a third of the district is served by a combined sewer system. And so um, when it reaches capacity during heavy storms, uh, it overflows a mixture of raw sewage and um, polluted stormwater into the Anacostia and our other waterways. And then finally, um, legacy toxics, mostly PCBs and PAHs, are an issue. They're trapped in our sediments, they bioaccumulate, and uh, pose health risks to wildlife and to subsistence fishers. Um, so, so how did we get here? We got here partially because of the development that I just described. But one of the things that we also looked at is that the Anacostia's pollution is in part a consequence of past federal actions. Um, we are located in the national capital region as a watershed, and so there were a lot of um, historical engineering um, standards that are practices that were taken historically by the federal government, and they were very standard practices at the time, but also unintentionally resulted in degradation to the Anacostia River. And those include things like filling in the tidal acreage and approving fill of wetlands that really has reduced the river's assimilative capacity and its ability to cleanse itself. Um, there was some munitions ma manufacturing that happened on the banks of the Anacostia and they built and operated the combined sewer overflow, uh, the combined sewer system for some time and channelized the river, et cetera. And so as our report argues, um, given these unintended yet nonetheless um, consequential actions on the river and that were in the nation's capital, the federal government um, has a special responsibility to the Anacostia. And in fact, our major recommendation is that the federal government join with the local jurisdictions um, to accelerate the cleanup of the river. Okay. So quickly, where are we and, and where do we need to be going? So we looked at existing legal obligations and 
cleanup policies, mostly in the realm of government. Um, there is a lot going on outside of government, and it was just too broad of a net to cast for us to be able to do it. And we had looked at stormwater, sewer overflows, and legacy toxics. And we found that existing stormwater obligations, um, particularly MS4 permits, work that's being done under the Bay TMDL, et cetera, will increase retrofits on public properties. Um, Montgomery County has a very strong stormwater permit. Some consider it one of the strongest in the Bay Area. A very strong stormwater permit has been introduced for the, or proposed for the District of Columbia and has not yet been finalized. And Prince George's County has one on the way. Um, there's also new stormwater rules for new development and redevelopment that will address the stormwater problem from future private development. Um, in terms of combined sewer overflows, DC Water has the long-term control plan or the Healthy Rivers plan, um, and that is modeled um, to, to eliminate combined sewer overflows in the Anacostia by 98%, and so that will be a significant contribution to the cleanup. And then finally, in legacy toxics, um, there are super fund initiatives happening by the federal government and some um, consent agreements or settlements by the <coughs> D.C. Department of Environment that are making progress on contaminated shoreside sites. So. All of those things are big, not to mention um, the Anacostia Watershed Restoration Plan, which, as I mentioned, was a plan created by the Anacostia Partnership. It outlines over 3,000 candidate restoration projects, um, as well as policies, many of which overlap with what's in our report that could be taken on in order to accelerate the restoration. Those things will all further the restoration and are critical pieces and components of restoring the Anacostia but because it is such a complex problem, there are some remaining impediments. Um, next slide. Oh, look at you. So the remaining impediments, we identified four remaining impediments. Um, the first one is just that there's a lot of privately owned impervious surfaces in need of stormwater upgrades. Um, a little over half of the impervious surface that already exists in the watershed is privately owned. Redevelopment will take care of some of that as it occurs, but it's not likely to occur for several decades or it'll happen kind of piecemeal. And I think about 20% belongs to single family homes, and those are not properties that are likely to undergo major redevelopment anytime soon. So there needs to be some way to address retrofitting existing impervious surfaces for private landowners. Um, the second is limited options for prompt remediation of legacy toxics. I'm not going to get into detail about this. Russ is the expert. Um, but the, the basic bottom line is that there's a lot of legacy contaminated sediment in the river that's difficult to address through the Clean Water Act because it can't be tied to current pollution sources. And so Superfund is an option, but it's a long and arduous legal process to undergo. Um, the third is divided jurisdictional authority over key restoration and land use decisions in the watershed. And this is not specific to our watershed. It's specific to any place where you have, you know, a state, the District of Columbia, which is also the federal, you know, the capital of the U.S., two counties. There's political jurisdictions there um, that don't match neatly with the boundaries of the watershed, and there's been an unprecedented effort by the partnership to coordinate those efforts, um, but just during difficult budget times, uh, it's difficult to coordinate among all of those, those different groups. Um, and then finally is just the cost of cleanup. The cost of cleanup is really high. The local jurisdictions um, are spending significant resources um, just to meet their Clean Water Act mandates, and so they have little room for additional resources for voluntary efforts. Um, and the plan that was identified uh, by the Army Corps of Engineers and the partnership um, has a large price tag, as does the combined sewer overflows. And so we're just looking at a heavy lift financially. So that's, that's it for my part of the presentation. Let me pick up the ball from, from there. I sort of gave you